Welcome to the show. I'm Doug Johnson. Each month, we produce a show that highlights a local personality who has something of extreme importance to say to all of us. This month, we have a rather unique individual, and he's a little unusual too. Evan Delahanty founded the company Peaceful Fruits, and we'll talk about that as the program goes on. But first off, um, I'm really happy to have made Evan's acquaintance real uh, recently. So, Evan, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks. Okay, so you have founded a company by the name of Peaceful Fruits. That's right. And before we get to that, tell us your backstory. What What about Evan? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Doug, for having me on, number one. And uh, so Evan grew up in Peninsula, not too far from here, just down the road. Okay. Uh, and... I went to Old Trail School, great little, you know, great little uh, early education and middle school program right there in Bath, Ohio, about five minutes from my house. Uh, went on to Walsh Jesuit High School, where I had a great, mm -hmm. really great foundation from both of those organizations in how to think critically and how to question and how to really engage with your environment. And both of those also really rooted me in that connection in your community and that connection to volunteering and service in your community. And that's something that's kind of very important to me throughout my life. Um, and after that, I went away to college. I went to Cornell University in upstate mm -hmm. New York, um, where I studied political science, but then also uh, did some time in the MBA program, you know, okay. get rooted in that, uh, that normal hardcore business stuff. <laughs> and I took those credentials and uh, worked for a company not too far from here, just over in Aurora Streetsboro, where I did... Um, operations and project management for an industrial supply company for four or five years where I was bossing around guys on forklifts and uh -huh. uh, making screws move around a warehouse. Okay. And it was, it was a whole lot of fun. It was an amazing responsibility where, you know, honestly, I think that being a good boss is just about one of the most important things in the world. And unusual. <laughs> Maybe so, hopefully not. But, uh, and I had that opportunity where, you know, as a 26-year-old, I had, 20 guys on forklifts working for me, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a responsibility and an opportunity to learn that you don't get too many places these right. days, you know, especially my, a lot of my peers coming out of college, you know, they're working on a spreadsheet, they're working on a binder, they're working, you know, whatever it is, but to really be able to get your hands dirty, work with people on real life problems was just incredibly exciting and empowering for me, but, uh, but in the end, I really saw that... Um, at McMaster Car, the company where I worked, I had the opportunity to make a really big impact on a really small problem. What, and what I mean by that is I could, you know, I was, I was in charge of, the, of you know, half the warehouse. If I wanted it to flow counterclockwise today and then, you know, the other way <laughs> tomorrow, like that, I had that power to, to experiment, to try to see what would be more efficient. But ultimately, that's what the goal was, was to make screws move around a warehouse more efficiently. So uh -huh. big impact on a pretty small problem, right? Uh, and so that's where, as I started to look, um, you know, what should my next career steps be? You know, should I go back to school? Should I, you know, move into a different industry? Whatever it might be. Um, I, uh, I decided that I wanted to do the opposite, to, you know, go to the very opposite end of the pool and look at, well, how can I have a very personal, very tiny, but still have, have, a, have an impact, even if it's tiny, on the biggest problem in the world, which is the uh, that disparity between the standard of living between ourselves in the developed world and you know the rest of the world that mm -hmm. lives in an, in an entirely different planet in many ways, and so that's where I chose to to join the Peace Corps, the United States Peace Corps, and uh, moved to a little village in the middle of nowhere in South America, just uh, smack dab in the middle of the Virgin Amazon. Literally, take the road until the sidewalk ends. Mm -hmm. Keep going for a while longer jump in a canoe, not, uh, not a, it was a you know, motorized canoe, not a paddle canoe, uh -huh. but still jump in a canoe for a couple of hours, climb up the riverbank, and there you were in my village, literally in the, in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. You know, it wasn't in Brazil, it was in Suriname, little country just next to Brazil there, but uh, there I was in Peak and Slay, the only American, you know, the only white guy, the only, uh -huh. you know, in, you know in English speaker, whatever, for miles around, working directly with the Council of Elders you know, who had requested someone come in to help them with a list of development priorities. And so we worked on 
everything from uh, a small solar energy project to bring in uh, lanterns and small solar panels to replace kerosene lamps and to allow cell phones to spread through the village. Uh, we worked on infrastructure improvements to make it easier for p people and goods to get you know, off the river into the village. Right. Uh, I did, you know, did HIV AIDS education you know, kind of across the gamut because I was there as a neighbor for two years living as one of the people, you know, they lived in the thatched roof hut, I lived in a thatched roof hut. You know, mm -hmm. they had electricity an hour or two a day if they were lucky. I had electricity, you know, it was right, right there. They washed their clothes in the river every day and so did I. And that's what Peace Corps is all about is really engaging with people mm -hmm. on that, that real human basis. And so as I finished that, that's where I came back, to the, came back here to Northeast Ohio where I'm from. And uh, I really wanted to do something that would connect these two places that I call home now or that, you know, kind of have claimed me. Sure. Uh, and I wanted to do something that would continue to empower the people there in the Amazon, um, but would also allow them and allow me and allow everyone along the chain to get some real value out of it. Because my, my shtick, if you will, you know, what I saw in, in Peace Corps is that sustainability, you know, to be sustainable, it's talking about environmentalism. It's talking about community engagement. Yes, all of those things are true. But you also have to talk about money. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do a project with the people there in the Amazon and you just ask them to donate their labor out of the goodness of their heart, that, that's borderline rude, right? You know, if, if I ask uh -huh. you to, to donate your, you know, an hour or two a week when, uh, you know, you can afford it, that's great. An hour or two a week when you're a subsistence farmer who's struggling to serve your, you know. It's a different story. It's a different story, yeah. right? Like, they live a lot closer to the margin. And so to say, like, hey, you know, I'm going to help you, uh, build a, a, a dock into the river and obviously I'm giving you cement so you should give me your labor for free M maybe you should but there, there are tra real trade-offs there where that's you know an hour of work where they're not harvesting the rice that they need to eat for the next month mm -hmm. and so that's where you know you just need to recognize the trade-offs that these people focus or that these people face and that's exactly what Peaceful Fruits does so my, my company we're a uh, fair trade natural fruit snacks company and what that means is that we offer the local people an economic opportunity to make money without having to totally uh, change their way of life, without totally abandoning their culture or abandoning the environment. So they're able to harvest the, the acai, which is the main ingredient in our fruit snacks. It's right. a berry from the Amazon. They're able to harvest those berries that grow wild on their lands, and then they sell them to us at a premium price so that they can make that little bit of money that they need to then you know, send their kid to school or take that hour off from the subsistence living and invest in their community or, you know, do, or do work on the project that will, that will not pay off in the next month when they need to eat, but will pay off over the next 10 years, which is what you need for a community to, to drive forward. And so to do that, people need to make a living in the meantime. And that's what Peaceful Fruits is all about, is giving people that opportunity to make a little bit of money, to invest in their future, but to do it on their own terms. And so that's uh, kind of how we went from Peninsula, Ohio, to the Amazon, and then <laughs> came all the way back and trying to build a bridge in between. Back again. So now in the production of the fruit leather, mm -hmm. um, you are using some other folks. So kind of you're helping people in South America, but you're also helping people here at home. Yes, and that, and that was very important to me. Um, so as I said, Peaceful Fruits really emphasizes that, uh, that fair trade aspect uh, what I like to think of as respectful, responsible economic empowerment. And when I say economic empowerment, what I mean is really giving people an opportunity to make a living. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, obviously that speaks to fair wages and good working conditions and all those people, those aspects, but it also talks to meeting people where they are. For the folks in the Amazon, that means let me give you a way to make money that doesn't require you to move to the city that doesn't require you to let someone come in and clear cut your land and destroy your environment and your religion and your culture. But what it, it also means it's, it's a way that, you know, day in, day out, you can work. The harder you work, the more money you make, the better you do a good job. You have this job for as long as you want it and you need it. And so when we started to look at uh, that model, what I really decided is I want to build that model into the business from A to Z, all mm -hmm. the way from there to here. And so when we started to look at how can we produce the snacks here in Ohio, uh, that's where we, we ended up meeting uh, Hattie Larlam and Blick Center. Sure. 
which are two local nonprofits that do clinical and vocational therapy for people with disabilities. And what I saw is that there's actually a tremendous overlap, you know, when, when you kind of take that, that big step back to say, these are people with so much value, with so much, you know, they have work ethic and care and responsibility and just value to offer both intrinsically as people, mm -hmm. but also a, as workers with a, with a unique resource. Um, and so if you can meet those people halfway in a respectful, responsible way, they can help you out in a, as a business, you know, barring all, the, all the, the hugging trees stuff, they can help you out as a business in some awesome and unique ways. And so that's where we work with the, those, those two organizations to employ, to provide full wage jobs for the people coming through those training programs so that they're helping us make a product which exactly fits, fits their skill set. So just you know, think about it, in the food industry, what do people love? They love simple artisan snacks, you know, no fancy processing, no weird ingredients, made with love. What does this population excel at? All of those things, mm -hmm. right? You know, if I was making ha uh, Har Harley Davidson's, you know, maybe that wouldn't make as much sense. I don't know, I haven't studied the market. <laughs> but, um, but for food products, you know, why do you pay $10 for a hamburger once and $20 for that, you know, the hamburger the next time. Maybe it's the chef, maybe it's the cooking, but, but mostly it's the ambiance. It, how does it make you feel? What's the story behind that, that food? And that's the same thing that we do as, as a business. And so by partnering with those people, we're able to invest in the community, we're, in, we're able to do something that is just so intrinsically right, but we're also able to get a business value out of it, a marketing benefit to say, hey, I make a fruit snack. Obviously, you know, General Mills makes a fruit snack too. Kellogg's makes a fruit snack too. Mm -hmm. So if you put me on the shelf next to them and you say, here you go, uh, this one makes 25 cents for Kellogg's. Nothing wrong with it, right? This one helps Evan save the rainforest and employs people with disabilities in your community. Which one are you gonna uh, pick, right? Exactly. And that, sure. that's, that's what we try to really emphasize for folks where it makes business sense, mm -hmm. but it also makes good community sense. Well, and obviously it's very important for you to give back. And, and you've talked about that a little bit. Why should it be important for us, the population in general, mm -hmm. to give back? Well, why is that so critical in today's society? You know, I, I think that's, that's a great question. And what you're already hearing a little bit is how I try to approach problems is I think about um, really that, that idealism, realism straddle. Mm -hmm. Right where, yes, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I hugged the trees. I kissed the babies. You know, all, all that kind of stuff. But I was also, you know, I went to a top twenty MBA program. I worked in private industry. You know, like I, 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 I have both of those aspects to my personality, and I think from both of those perspectives, doing good in your community, whatever that means to you, makes so much sense because you're investing in the future mm -hmm. and it's and it's very 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 simple like to put it in very cold-blooded terms if you make a bunch of money and you don't put any of that money back in your community you're not gonna have good places to spend your money right like if you want a safe street to walk down and a nice bar to go to then you need to be talk engage with your local police officer mm -hmm. right and then what's the police officer gonna tell you like oh well if you want to help me do my job better engage with a local school right because more, you know, better educated kids cause less problem. And then when you go to the school, what are they going to tell you? Well, engage with a local farmer because kids that are hungry don't learn as well. And so as you start to have that community engagement, you see all of these different aspects where you can, you know, you can choose what appeals to you. You can choose what, uh, you know, what excites you. Mm -hmm. But if, if folks aren't investing in, in some of those different elements, you end up with, you know, a crappy street with no good restaurants, with nowhere fun to spend your money. And, and obviously there's other arguments for why this is the right thing to do, right. but even in the most cold-blooded way possible, if you wanna have a nice place to live, you have to give back, you have to invest in the community. Because if you don't do it, nobody else is gonna either. And then there's, there's no fun to be had, there's no standard of living for you, even here in the developed world. And that, that's kind of my, that's the, that straddle where, yeah, you should do it because it feels good, you should do it because it's the right thing, but let's be honest, do it because it means you'll have more fun on your weekend. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's so important and, and so rare, it seems, in today's world where it seems like everyone has a career, everyone is out for that career, mm -hmm. and it's more me-oriented. <clears throat> so how can we get from that me-orientation to where you are? 
Well, I, I think that it, it's all about perspective, right? Um, and what, what I really mean by perspective is just taking the time to, you know, step back or, or zoom out or, you know, whatever cliche you want to put it, but to really see uh, how, how interconnected things are. And, you know, that, that's where um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump around here a little bit, but uh, one, of the, one of the things that Peace Corps really focuses on, which I, th I think, you know, you said we might talk about a little bit, is a quote by Sergeant Shriver mm -hmm. to say, Absolutely. break your mirrors. Yep. And, wh and what, what that means, you know, break your mirrors, it's not talking about, you know, violence or shattering things. It's talking about look beyond yourself, right? Where if you just take that step back and, you know, do that swivel, you're going to see people that are struggling with the same things. You're going to see people that are having similar problems, having similar desires, having similar needs. And whether they, you know, look the exact same as you from, you know, skin or gender or, or whatever else it might be, they're doing the same things and having the same problems. And whether it's a million dollars or one dollar, it's all, it's all the same stuff. And once you kind of realize that, it's impossible to not treat others as people. And, and once you realize that, the key argument is, it's not saying like someone's more deserving or less deserving or anything like that, but you start to realize how quickly one person can change with another, right? Where, why am I able to sit here and my friend Edwa is, you know, is sitting in that canoe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's an accident of birth. And yeah, like I've worked hard, I've educated myself, I've hustled, I've done all those things, but what's to say that if he hadn't, you know, if he hadn't been born, he wouldn't be doing 10 times better than me? You know, we, we, don't, we don't know. And so it's not to disrespect what you know, any individual has accomplished with the cards that they were dealt, because that's so important. But at the same time, just to realize you know, that hand can vary, you know, the hand that you're dealt can vary so much and there are things that we can do very easily to help those others, to help those others out without costing ourselves anything. And that, that's where it's so important to think about it in that little more global and that little more community oriented perspective of like, hey, we're, we're more the same than we are different. And maybe I'm here and you know, you're there and wherever, but who knows where we'll be next week. The world changes fast. Interesting. Um, and your education and, and your work experience kind of leads to where you are. Can you talk about who were your role models when you were growing up? Um, because certainly there might have been some role models in the schools that you went to or where you worked. Uh, but who were your role models when you were growing up? I think uh, I'll point to, to, two, uh, to two folks. So number one would be very much 100% is my parents. Mm -hmm. Where I think, you know, that's every, everybody's first hero is you know is their mom or their dad or both at least at least that was the experience for me you know I hope that's true for I know it's probably not true for everyone but uh, you know that's the first the first chance to be a hero is is your mom and your dad and for me that is a hundred percent true mm -hmm. where what I respect so much about my parents is that they really you know, li lived that realism idealism straddle as well and and kind of had the courage of their convictions where you know they both went to you know a good school in in New York. And then they decided that you know they wanted to embrace the that back to the land movement you know there in the in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and they moved to West Virginia and they started a, a dirt farm right and they were you know they raised pigs they raised goats you know they planted their food they tried to be a self-sustaining farm mm -hmm. and uh, over time as they realized how you know kind of what I had said what I talked about already of sustainability also means you have to be able to eat you have to be able to make money sure. and they were showing that they weren't able to do that you know that's when my dad. Uh, you know, went back to college, did the classes that he would need, and then, you know, he and my mom worked together to put him through medical school, right, to become a physician, where then, you know, he moved here to Northeast Ohio, he started his own practice, and he, you know, built his way up in that field. And so th that's where, uh, you know, to, to see people like that, my parents literally go from, you know, a relatively privileged spot to a very, very unprivileged spot where they were, you know, cannibalizing nails from the shed that was falling down on this mm -hmm. side of their property to rebuild the house on that side of the, the property, you know, to then being a successful doctor, you know, in a, in a, in a well-off community. That's an incredible journey that I have so much respect for. Um, and what that, that taught me is to really think about, again, that, that courage of your convictions, you know, that idea of get out there and try, and if it doesn't work out, that's okay, you know, pivot, mm -hmm. move on. It doesn't mean it wasn't valuable. 
you know, obviously they're not still dirt farmers in, in West right. Virginia. It doesn't mean that they, but it means they understand those challenges and they respect the people that, uh, that are in that life and have been successful at it because well, they weren't, right? Yeah, and uh, I think that probably gave them a, a good aspect of, of value. Absolutely, absolutely. And it gives them that, again, that perspective where, you know, if you ask my dad, what's one of the things that made him successful as a physician? Bedside manner, right? Mm -hmm. Where I understand what a hard day's work on a farm or, you know, behind the wheel of a truck or whatever it might be is, and I can, I can talk to those people, you know, to have that interaction, and that makes you a better doctor. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so it's that, it goes back to that perspective, right? But then one of the other people that I want to point to uh, is, I, you know, I, I mentioned that I went to Walsh Jesuit High School, mm -hmm. and uh, I myself am not, am not Catholic. Uh, Walsh obviously is a, is a Catholic high school, but uh, what I respected so much about the faculty and the Jesuit priests there in particular is how they really taught you to question and to think, where it was an incredible experience to be in a place where you know almost everyone was Catholic, almost everyone you know believed the same things, and, and I, I didn't, you know that's not my, my background, but to have a respectful conversation mm -hmm. with someone who doesn't share your beliefs and for them to be able to answer your questions, to you know explore that with you, like, well, here's this, this is what I believe, and here's why, and here are the facts. And here, here are the reasons, and here are where those things end, and why it's just what I believe. You know, whether that's a religious base or you know a science base or you know whatever. Like, there's always that point where you get you know beyond the facts and you get to opinions, and to be able to take a conversation, to take a relationship up to that point, and then to admit when you get beyond that point, that's something that I feel our our modern society is really losing the ability to you know, we're, we're losing the ability to have those kind of conversations, and mm -hmm. so. To really be grounded in that, I think has helped me so much as a person, as a professional, to be able to, to question respectfully and to understand, you know, I believe this because I believe it, and, or, you know, this is what the facts say, and this is as far as I can, you know, but there's a point where those end, and beyond that, it's faith, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Well, and it seems to me that all of what you're talking about, you used when you had a recent appearance on Shark Tank. Yeah, a yeah. TV show, which is really exciting. I need to put that out there. Yeah. Um, you know, we watched it and um, just really enjoyed what you did on it. Thank you. And obviously you were a success on there. Um, having said that, because of time limitations, mm -hmm. though, I want to talk about some other strategies for success that our guests, our audience can use. And you talked about break your mirrors, mm -hmm. and, and I absolutely love that concept. One of the other strategies for success that, that we've talked about mm -hmm. uh, is a quote from you, which is, eat better for a better world. The, the other is, sweat the small stuff. What can you tell us about those two? Yeah, I think eat better for a better world. What that means to me is it kind of going back to that idea of, to, to invest in your community, to do what's right, to, you know, to, to make the world a better place, you don't have to go out of your way necessarily. You don't have to sacrifice your standard of living. You just have to make a conscious decision about your consumption, right? About where you spend your time, where you spend your dollars, how you live your life, where um, eat a fruit, if you want a fruit snack, by taking that extra three seconds to flip the back over mm -hmm. and see which one has three ingredients and which one has 30, you're impacting the world, right? To see what, if when you're buying your coffee, do you buy the fair trade one, do you not? Does it cost you 10 extra cents? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't even cost you any extra, any extra money. But to choose to vote with your dollars, to vote with your feet, that's what eat, eat Better for a Better World means. It's to, in a very convenient, everyday way, do the little things that are gonna change the world in the way that you wanna change it. It doesn't have to be the $100,000 donation. It doesn't have to be the move to the Amazon for two years, right? There are mm -hmm. little things you can do every day to shape your world into a better place. And that's, I think, kind of also ties into the, the, the second one that we discussed, which is sweating the small stuff. Mm -hmm. that, that means what are the little things that you can take 100% control over to, to, to improve your world, to take control of your world, to say, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that I, like, you know, for Shark Tank, I know where all the numbers are, I know where all the eyes are dotted and all the T's are crossed, mm -hmm. 
because this is this is my my business this is my mission and you can you, you can't control the big things right like if the if the world decides that acai is passe you know no one wants to eat fruit snacks anymore there's nothing i can do about that but i can make sure that this is done right that it tastes good that it's made right that it's you know harvested right and i can do all of those little things to set myself up for success and and that's where i'm not saying you know like oh stress out about the small stuff you know like there's the old saying don't sweat the small stuff and that's talking about a different side of it what i'm saying is take control of what you can and set yourself up for success we have just a little bit of time um, we you and i have talked about active listening mm -hmm. can you just really throw that in there so when i was in peace corps uh, one of the inc incredible things about that culture is you'll have a, a big town hall meeting like you know you see on cnn the t town hall vice presidential debate or whatever it might be and the difference in the way that they do those meetings is they have a designated listener where instead of speaking to a faceless crowd, you're engaged with someone where I'm listening to you and then I'm turning to the audience and I'm saying, did you hear that? Did you understand that? Do we hear? And there's that give and take between the audience where that's what creates connection. That's what creates uh, uh, communi true communication where you're not mm -hmm. just talking at someone, you're talking with someone to have that engagement which is exactly how you build a relationship to be successful at, at whatever you do. So it's really engaging with people instead of just talking at them. Well, and I, I think that's excellent advice to, to end the show on. Evan, thank you so much for being today. My pleasure, Doug. It has been a real pleasure, and uh, we'll get together soon. Sounds good. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Evan. Absolutely. So we've all heard about setting expectations. Here's an example from one of my business clients, but it also applies to real life. Years ago, a client of mine spent many months looking for the perfect person to hire for a position he was trying to fill. He finally hired a young man, and on the Monday morning when the young man was to start, this business owner called me and asked me the question, how do I fire this person? I said, well, you just hired him. He just started. He said, yes, he did. And he was dressed inappropriately and he showed up late and I want to fire him. I thought, good grief. This guy spent a lot of money on this. So let's back up. I said to the client, okay, hold on. What if you invite him back in your office, tell him that you got off on the wrong foot, apologize, it was your fault, set the expectation. Did you do that at any point during the job process? No, I didn't. He should know how to dress and to be on time. I said, well, obviously he didn't. Just give this a try, see what happens. Weeks later, I talked with this business owner and asked him how the new employee was working out. You know what his response was? Best employee ever. And if I hadn't set those expectations after our conversation, he'd be gone. So set the expectations and let people know what they are.